Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the BlockRef webinar organized by the British Blockchain Association. BlockRef stands for Blockchain Research and Education Forum. My name is Nassim Nakhvi and I'm the president of the BBA and the uh, editor-in-chief of the Journal of the British Blockchain Association. Um, I'm your host today for this webinar. Just a few announcements to make before I introduce you to our very special guest and start the session. First of all, the aims and objectives of these webinars is to have uh, a high quality discussion and debate around uh, current emerging trends in the blockchain space. Also to raise awareness and most importantly, um, educate our members on some of the key topics uh, in the blockchain. So questions that we always wanted to ask, but we never really get a chance to do so. So these are bite-sized sessions. They last for about 20 to 25 minutes in a very easy to follow uh, format. And essentially seven questions. <clears throat> and then the guests will have around two to three minutes to answer each of the questions and share uh, their expert views. There are no live questions. And the reason is that we aim to uh, stick to 20 to 25 minutes maximum and to conclude these sessions in time. Um, however, if uh, feel free to write uh, any questions that you may have, and we will forward these to our uh, speakers. If we receive a lot of questions, then what we could do is we can, of course, arrange another interactive type uh, session in future. The list of all upcoming webinars are on the website and we aim to host these once a month to begin with and members will receive the join in link uh, a week or so before the session. For the CPD certificates, if you could uh, please email to our admin team with your full name that you would like to uh, uh, appear on the certificates, we will get this sent to you afterwards. These webinars are exclusively for BBA members. Uh, after a couple of months, what we will do is we will upload the, uh, the recorded sessions on our YouTube channel under open access uh, license, and at which point they will uh, be accessible by uh, the general public. We <clears throat> would welcome organizations to sponsor these webinars, and we will be very happy to promote you uh, at the beginning of the session by displaying your logo or acknowledging your, 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 your contribution by saying that this, this month's webinar is brought to you by XYZ or whatever. Uh, so the next month we have uh, Richard Brown of R3 Corda speaking uh, at one of uh, our webinars. Lastly, these are uh, audio webinars. Um, there is no video. Um, so you can uh, join in and listen to these sessions while you are on the move, driving, eating, in your bed, whatever. There is no need to, to, to log in with your video. Uh, some speakers might wish to share their slides, which is fine, but there are no slides today. Uh, it's just a discussion. So let's get started. And <clears throat> I'm, I'm really very excited today because we have uh, with us uh, Professor Mark Pilkington, who is uh, uh, Associate Editor-in-Chief of uh, the JBBA and also a professor of uh, economics uh, at the University of Burgundy in France. In 2015, I think it was the end of 2015, um, he posted an article uh, titled Blockchain Technology Principles and Applications on Social Sciences Research Network, SSRN. And the article now, so this was about four years ago, this article is now the most downloaded blockchain article in the world um, with over 33,000 downloads and 64,000 abstract views as of today. Uh, so it's a great uh, honor uh, to have uh, Mark with us today. Uh, Mark, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello, everyone.
Patient, thank you very much for the the nice uh, presentation, nice introduction. It's my honor to be with you uh, uh, today with the, the the listeners and yourself, and I look forward to uh, answering uh, your your questions uh, uh, in this in this session. Thank you, Mark. So, uh, <coughs> Mark, if we start off by now, we have this. Uh, we know that the managers, 90% uh, of them make decisions that are not evidence-based. This is from a, a study that was done some time ago. And we also know that 70% uh, of ICOs have kind of failed and they could not deliver on the, on the promise. So the success of anything that we do in life is really largely dependent upon the quality of decisions that we make. So the better decisions we, that we make, the more evidence-based decisions that we make, the better the outcomes are. Uh, so for non-academics and these policy makers and people in, uh, in authority, most of the time not academics, and whilst we understand the importance of peer review, evidence-based science, high quality research, uh, sometimes people in the in the position of authority uh, and, and, and higher up are not very familiar and nobody really know how they really make decisions. They should be making evidence-based decisions. So in the blockchain space, how can we convey and emphasize the importance of, of evidence-based practice to blockchain uh, professionals? Okay. So peer, Peer review is something absolutely uh, critical to the uh, process of uh, scientific endeavor, scientific inquiry. I think it's also very critical to the, um, the issue of the trust that the public at large is going to put into uh, science itself. So we're talking about evidence-based or, or peer review. What are we talking about? It's very much about the uh, confidential evaluation of a submitted manuscript, an article, by one or more individuals who are experts in one or more uh, aspects of the work uh, under review. And in fact, uh, peer review has been one of the most effective forms of self-regulation within the uh, academic profession for centuries. Uh, however, this a very effective form of self-regulation is not always uh, uh, well understood. Sometimes it's misrepresented. So what are we talking about here? Peer review, when you're submitting an article to an academic journal, it means that it's going to be evaluated by at least two experts in the field. So this evaluation is going to be anonymous. And afterwards, the editor will make a decision either to reject, to accept, or to accept with minor or my major revisions. And in this sense, GBBA, Journal Blo British Blockchain Association, is uh, peer reviewed on the basis of expert uh, opinions. So I repeat, peer review is something that is going to guarantee the anonymity of evaluation and its credibility in the eyes of the academic profession. Now, in case of conflicting reviews, because this may happen, the editor, the chief editor, may have a a decision, an editorial decision to make based on the perceived strengths of the respective reviewers in the specific fields or subfields that pertains to uh, the submission. So this is basically what I have to say about uh, peer review. It's something that is very, very valuable in order to ensure the credibility and the quality of uh, uh, scientific uh, output. Yes. 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 Um, my second question is connected to the way it is in the sense that um, the, the, the uncertainties and, and confusions and the hype and the answer to questions that we don't know, and obviously there are so many questions that we don't know the answer to, we think that high quality research and high quality education will uh, help us in addressing some of those uh, unknowns in this field? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Of course, I think the answer lies pretty much in the question here. Like quality education and blockchain research are not only interrelated, but I think they will also help prevent counterproductive attitudes uh, towards the technology itself. So we have all seen over the last 18, uh, the past 18 months, some uh, 
speculative trends in the blockchain space and high volatility of blockchain or cryptocurrency uh, prices, sometimes some useless blockchain tokens thrown into uh, the space, sometimes even some ICO scams. Yeah. However, what I would like to say here is that all it does not undermine one second the uh, fantastic transformative potential of the technology itself, um, which is enormous, which is huge. What we're talking about here are new architectures which are being designed, new interfaces between economic agents, higher level of decentralization in the economy uh, for citizens, uh, massive cost reduction strategies for businesses. So all of this is useful and needs to be researched and needs to be uh, distinguished from uh, what I call surface phenomena. And it's true that there is a perception today that is sometimes uh, widespread that the technology is overhyped. There was a recent survey by Deloitte in 2018, and I think uh, almost 40% of the resp respondents, which were all part of the digital economy, said that blockchain, uh, the technology itself was overhyped. And I think one of the reasons for this feeling or this impression that the technology is overhyped is that the technology itself is being conflated with the, um, the incentive layer of public blockchains, this basically the, the blockchain tokens. So again, I repeat, it's very uh, important to distinguish between surface phenomena and the deeper level of um, investigation of research into the, uh, the actual benefits of the technology. So only education uh, and blockchain research can contribute to this objective and, uh, and try to uh, be a solution to the, the, the hype, the uncertainty, the confusion that, that surrounds uh, blockchain sometimes. Yes, yes. Uh, very, 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 very interesting. Uh, comment uh, i think i agree completely um some 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 institutions um universities academic institutions obviously they are they are far ahead uh, they are taking lead um and 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 in in advancing research we know high quality research is coming from from those institutions while at the same time a lot of Universities certainly that I talk to, uh, they some of them not even heard of it, not interested in it, um, and their researchers and students are coming to us all the time, saying my head of the department or dean has has got no interest in this DLT or blockchain. So, what are the reasons you think, or and what are the one or two solutions to how we address these? I mean, going forward and. And how can we get these institutions to take lead in this? Mm -hmm. So thank you for that question, because I think it's really crucial. Um, I'm part of academia myself, and I think this is uh, such a, an important question for the future. So first question I think we need to ask ourselves is why would a researcher or group of researchers devote time and resources to this new technology that everybody's talking about called blockchain. I think my answer here before talking about the institutional viewpoint is that we need to be able to provide a structure of incentives such as uh, new publication opportunities in a high quality outlets such as GBBA for instance in order to be able to um, overcome the issue of uh, inertia or his, what we call hysteresis that sometimes is to be found in the academic profession. Why would I change my research program? Why would I incorporate this new technology that everybody is talking about? And it's true that in my home university in France, we are just a few isolated researchers working on this technology. There is no coordinating platform or department, which means that research is very much fragmented. So it doesn't make it easy for the students or for the PhD students. Now, a counter example, a good model would be, I think, uh, you're all familiar with uh, CBT, UCL, University College London. I was working myself, I was on leave a couple of years ago in uh, far eastern Europe, a little country, and I was in charge, but the project was short-lived, but I was in charge of a small blockchain center at the time. And so even though the project was short-lived, I have 
uh, experience or expertise in putting together like an institutional um, project whose objective uh, main goal would be to channel the resources of the higher education institution and try to foster interdisciplinary collaboration between scholars, uh, also with students, and by the same token, try to provide the much needed structure of incentives that I was talking about in, 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 in my introduction. So uh, the thing is, in the early years of Bitcoin, uh, blockchain, uh, research was very much a, um, a bottom-up process, but I think we've reached a sort of plateau now. We need to have some kind of um, uh, top-down um, strategic decision-making uh, process that is taking place at the highest level of the higher uh, uh, education institution in order to put together these blockchain uh, centers or learning uh, resource centers or whatever you may call Call it, but we need to have some kind of institutional design within uh, higher education institutions in order to foster uh, research and education on uh, on blockchain technology. So this is very much what I have to say about the uh, the problem of uh, some institutions that are lagging behind and what we could do, what we uh, uh, could try to do in order to solve that um, that um, problem. And uh I think the next question really is connected to who should fund blockchain research because we have uh, obviously corporates and, and organizations, uh, big multinationals, uh, uh, multi-million corporations, um, IBM, Microsoft, etc., cetera, um, doing, uh, participating in this industry blockchain research. And then we have this uh, theoretical uh, scientific um, uh, computer science related uh, blockchain research uh, being done at universities. And obviously there are some individuals who are just interested in blockchain or DLT or cryptocurrencies doing their own research, funding their own research. And there are uh, some other institutions like Wellcome Trust or, or Melinda Gates Foundation, for example, funding some research projects. So um, who should be funding these research projects uh, related to blockchain and innovative uh, technologies? Dr. Nassim, if you look today at the, uh, the blockchain ecosystem as a whole, uh, we are, hello, can you hear me? We, we, yes, we are aware yes. that, that, that it's made of uh, different uh, classes of actors, what we call stakeholders, each one of them is pursuing a specific set of objectives that will depend on their uh, the nature of these stakeholders. So I was talking about the early years of the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem, some like 10 years ago. At the time, research was very fragmented. Today, blockchain has become, in the eyes of many, a disruptive force with enormous benefits for profit-making organizations. So whether we are talking about startup companies, corporations, or even invest um, institutional investors, these investment opportunities are being seized today by these private actors especially in the light of the cost minimization potential of the technology, the increased transparency and the elimination of the trusted third party and the middleman. All this is very well understood. However, I am somebody who believes that there is also attached to this technology, attached to blockchain, there is also a public good, uh, common good dimension attached to it. And there are many examples, examples abound in the recent uh, uh, news. I could give you an example of the UN World uh, Food Program, um, which is working on blockchain technology in order to facilitate cash transfers, I think, in Jordan to help um, Syrian refugees. Uh, I was living in Moldova uh, which is Europe's poorest country uh, a couple of years ago. And here yeah, was an interesting use case devised, uh, designed by UNDP in order to uh, fight uh, child trafficking. Another example of a blockchain here used for the, the common good. So there are many such projects. Today I was reading the news, my news uh, thread, 
in Colorado in the US, Colorado has announced the appointment of the first ever blockchain architect. So which means we're going to have here a, a veteran of IT and information technology is going to operate at the state level in order to promote blockchain research at the government level and at the state level. So my conclusion here is that the ecosystem, uh, the blockchain ecosystem is characterized by a plurality, a diversity of stakeholders that research can continue to be funded from different sources, from uh, business sources, government sources, NGOs, and uh, rich individuals as well. I think all this is working in a, say, in a common uh, direction of, uh, of the, uh, the enhancement, the improvement, and the growth of the, uh, the ecosystem as a whole. Yes. 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 Okay, uh, Mark, just moving on the, 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 the shift focus of the uh, webinar slightly towards our students, researchers, um, and some of them uh, have joined us today. So, your article, one of the most downloaded articles uh, on SSRN, uh, you've been doing quite a lot of research, very active in this space, writing papers, reviewing papers. What are the top three tips on writing a world-class blockchain research paper? And also my second question is, what are the top three reasons for an article to get rejected uh, uh, by a blockchain journal? Okay, so Dr. Nassim, thank you very much for the vote of uh, confidence, for your appreciation for, for my work in the blockchain space. Very appreciative of your comments. Um, you're talking about this paper that has been downloaded and cited many, many times. I have to say your question, what, what does it take to write a, a world-class blockchain paper? My answer in whole humility is I don't know. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that one should intend to write a world-class uh, blockchain paper, but what students should do, everybody should, should do, is to, to intend to write the best paper that you possibly can. And what's going to, be, to happen afterwards, the reception of the paper, is not always something that you can control. However, what you can control are the skills that you're going to display in the process of writing your paper. So let me mention, of course, uh, intellectual rigor, intellectual uh, honesty, consistency between your hypothesis and your research design. And of course, and I probably explained the, 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 the relative success of my paper a few years ago, the paper has to be timely. So it has to be based on a very good knowledge, understanding of the uh, literature, but also a kind of, you know, you need to feel the literature. It is a time, there's a space for this paper to be written right now. Second tip, so this is one big, you know, using the, uh, the common uh, research skills that you have been taught uh, at the university. A second tip would be to try to make contact with a few experts in the field. Uh, this is what happened to me with my editor at the time because it was a, an intended uh, book chapter that I was writing for an edited book. Try to contact a few experts in the field, try to get some feedback, incorporate or not their comments, but at least afterwards you will have a better overview of, uh, of the paper as a whole. Third and last tip that I think is very important, and it's very simple what I'm going to say, it might surprise you. What I think is of crucial importance when doing blockchain research is that you need to love what you're doing. And I'm very serious about this last point. If you have a trade-off between, I don't know, some kind of leisure activity, something you enjoy doing and your blockchain research, you're going to opt for the blockchain research, not because it's an obligation, not because it's a constraint, but all the reverse, it's because it's something that you love, that you enjoy doing. I think it's very important to try to combine pleasure, fun, some might say, and, and hard work at the same time. And this will drive you ahead of, of, of competition sometimes. 
Um, now, reasons why an article might get rejected by the reviewers. So you're probably familiar with the uh, process when you submit an article to a journal. That there is a chief editor, sometimes a second editor, sometimes who's going to reject the manuscript at the early stage if the paper is scientifically poor, if it's not suitable for the readership of the journal, if it's not original. Now, if your paper, if your submission, sorry, does get sent out for review, and uh, what is going to happen? It's going to be uh, re-evaluated along a stringent and rigorous uh, reviewing uh, criteria. Now, why would it be, why can it be rejected sometimes? One reason that I see is that if it contains a lot of secondary research, that merely extends or replic replicates, sorry, existing published findings, but without anything, without adding any substantial knowledge, without adding anything new. This is what we are expecting from a submission that you are adding something to, uh, to the literature. A uh, second reason I think why a paper can be rejected if the results are not original, if they are kind of boring, too predictable, uh, trivial. So you need to have something interesting to convey, to share with the, uh, with the scientific community in your, in, your, in your paper. A third reason I can see is that if your paper, once you have reached a conclusion, if your paper doesn't have any theoretical or practical implications at all, this is a bad sign. You need to, uh, you're doing research, you're conducting your research because it has some theoretical or some practical uh, implications for at least a subset of the research community. Okay, so very important to, to have some implications for your research. Other reasons very quickly might uh, include that your paper is poorly written, so it doesn't matter if you're not a native speaker of English, but try to have your article checked, proof checked, proof read. Also follow the guidelines of the journal you're submitting to. This is very important. And do not exceed the word limit, things like this. Every single detail counts at the submission stage. We're not talking about unfinished working papers. We're talking about proper submissions to high quality journals. So you have to pay attention to detail and uh, be as uh, rigorous as you can be in your um, submission. Excellent. Very comprehensive advice, Mark. Uh, last question is, uh, we get a lot of, we get approached by MSc students, uh, uh, BSc students, MA uh, at universities, and they are, they've heard about blockchain or, or digital currencies, and they're interested in pursuing an academic uh, career in, in, in blockchain. So, any tips for, for those um, students and researchers if they have a primary specialty like economics, finance, computer science, but they are interested in uh, doing a project or some research in the blockchain space? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I'll say it's a very important question. I would describe myself as a blockchain um, generalist. Uh, blockchain journalists, somebody who, who understands the basic concepts behind, you know, behind the technology is capable of engaging into a discussion in the discussion on use cases, on the applications for the uh, ecosystem. So you've got uh, academic people like myself that think about supply chain managers, equity traders, financial advisors. These are people who are supposed to or are expected to be um, blockchain journalists. Now, I am not a computer science person. I don't have any coding skills, uh, but I think it's important to mention that because um, to understand the technology, sometimes you need to acquire, it depends, it depends on your professional objectives, basically. I have identified here a second category of um, professional, who I would, I would label the smart contract uh, 
developer. The people who can understand what smart contracts are, how they are powered and fueled by the technology, and people who know how to code at the same time. So this is very much about combining some coding skills that you're going to learn in your computer science classes and the technology um, itself, how it works. But as a smart contract um, developer, you don't need to understand everything about you are some kind of specialist here some software uh, development specialist a bit like a ui a user interface um, developer if you if you like the, um, the the metaphor but you don't need to understand any, everything about mining about uh, uh, some of the technical aspects of the technology however if you want to become what i call a blockchain so not just a smart contract but a blockchain um, developer or expert in this um, in this case you need to have a wide ranging uh, understanding of all the conceptual background behind the technology, uh, whatever pertains to nodes, to consensus mechanisms, to be a bit of a, like a bridge be be between the, 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 the second category, like the, the smart contract developer, and this um, broader category of blockchain developers. And these people, what are they going to be working on? They are going to design the new architecture of the future, the new blockchain systems. Uh, think about Ethereum networks, all these well-known public blockchains that we uh, work with on a daily basis. Uh, very much these blockchain uh, developers need to combine intellectual, um, academic uh, curiosity and also more specific technical um, coding skills in order to design the architecture of the future blockchain system. So I repeat three categories that I have identified, the blockchain generalists, and I think I am uh, one myself, or at least I try to be, uh, smart contract um, developers, and finally the blockchain expert or the blockchain um, developer that, are, that is combining basically all these uh, skills put um, together. So this is my answer to your question. The advice I would be giving to MSc students, first try to identify your professional aspirations, your professional objectives, and then try to acquire the, uh, the relevant skills in the, in, in, in the space. Yeah, excellent, excellent. I think it's very, very interesting uh, taxonomy and classification of blockchain professionals, generalists, uh, smart contracts, and blockchain, the actual blockchain computer science coding uh, folks. Um, excellent, I, I learned a lot and, and I'm sure uh, our uh, participants today uh, have uh, learned a few new things. Uh, certainly it was very, very informative uh, and, and, and I learned a few uh, new things uh, today. So um, I would like to, uh, uh, say thanks, uh, a big thanks to, to Mark uh, Wilkington for, for joining us and thank you to all of you uh, for being a part of this webinar. Please do email your names uh, to our admin, admin at britishblockchainassociation.org for the certificates and um, <clears throat> we will upload this on our YouTube channel in a few weeks time. And next webinar is on 18th of June with Richard Brown of R3 Corda. Uh, so thank you very much all for joining. If you have any questions uh, that you want to ask, please feel free to forward them as well with your emails uh, and we'll forward these to, to Mark. Uh, so Mark, thank you very much again uh, for uh, joining us today and we'll see you all uh, next month on the 18th of June.